All right, well, good evening, church. Listen, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Will Franco. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. And uh, this evening, we get the opportunity uh, to observe and to commemorate one of the most important dates on the church calendar, and that is Good Friday. Now, for those of you who are new to church and don't really know what Good Friday is, Good Friday is the opportunity the church takes to look back and to reflect on and to commemorate the death, the burial, and the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I want to do tonight is we are going to look um, at a very well-known story. It's a very well-known story, but it's an often overlooked story in the life of Jesus. And the story that I want to look at tonight, uh, the story that the Lord placed on my heart to share with you tonight, is the story of the two thieves. The, the two thieves, the one who was crucified on Jesus' left and the one who was crucified on his right. That is the story that the Lord just really ministered to me with this week as I was preparing for Good Friday, meditating on Good Friday. And so the story, like I said, that we're looking at is the story of the two thieves. And what's fascinating about this story is that all the Gospels actually talk about this story. All the Gospels make reference to this story. But tonight what I want to do is I want to look at Luke's account of this story. Uh, the, 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 one of the, the writers of the, uh, in the Bible is Luke. He's a, a Gentile author. He's a doctor. And he has an account that's very different from the others. He, he gets way more details in the story, and it really ministered to me, and my prayer is that it will minister to you tonight, especially as we reflect on the death and the burial and the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the passage that we're going to be looking at tonight comes from Luke chapter 23, verses 32 through 43. Luke 23, verses 32 through 43. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. Um, it's towards the end of the Gospel of Luke. So Luke 23... 32 through 43. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Here's what it says. Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. He says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me. Everyone say, remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's the word of the Lord. Let me pray. Father, we, we come before you this evening, and uh, we are just so grateful, Lord, for, for who you are. We are so grateful, Lord, for what you've done. And Lord, as we reflect on your, on your death, help us, Lord, to see this story with, with new eyes. Lord, I know that for me, I, I confess my own coldness. Uh, Lord, I felt that even coming up to this week, I was more focused on what I had to do to get ready instead of what you had already done. Forgive me, Lord, for my own coldness. Forgive me, Lord, for my own unbelief. Forgive me, Lord, for forgetting and, and, and not applying the gospel into my own life. And so, Lord, even as I preach on this passage, I pray that you would minister to me even as you minister to others. Jesus, we need you. And the cross is the ultimate example of that. We love you. And we pray all this in your name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So like I already mentioned, uh, tonight what we're going to be doing is we are going to be looking at Good Friday. We are going to be looking at the crucifixion of Jesus through the lens, through the perspective of these two thieves. 
Now, here's my goal uh, tonight. My goal tonight is to show you that every person in this room is represented by one of these two thieves. Every person, if you have a pulse here tonight, every person in this room is represented by one of these two thieves. As I would put it to you this way. If there's a thief on Jesus' left and a thief on Jesus' right, pretend that there is a, an imaginary line be behind both of them. And every person on planet Earth is either lined up behind this thief or that thief. We will see, my hope is as we, as we work through this passage, is that as we go through it, you will be able to figure out which thief are you. Which, which thief best describes you. Now, the way we are going to do this tonight is we are going to look at this passage under two headings. We are going to look at the two thieves, and then after we look at the two thieves, we are going to look at the two crosses. The two thieves and the two crosses. Now, the first part of the story that I want to take a closer look at tonight and I want to zoom in on is the two thieves. Now, this week, as I was comparing and contrasting these two thieves, one of the things that caught me off guard is that these thieves were similar in some ways and very different in other ways, okay? And as I compared and contrasted, what I discovered is that they had two similarities and two differences. So I want to begin by giving you the two similarities because we're going to move through that a lot quicker, and then we're going to spend a little bit more time uh, addressing the two differences, okay? So here were the two similarities. These, these two thieves were similar in the crime they committed and in their condition. So they were similar in crime and in their condition. Let's begin with the first one. The first similarity between these two thieves was their crime. According to the Gospel of Matthew, now remember, we're looking at Luke's account, but in Matthew's account, he uses a very specific Greek word to describe him, which is actually the word that a lot of us use when we talk about this story. Matthew describes them again and again as thieves, as thieves. Now, in the Greek, that, that word there, it means a robber or a plunderer, okay? So what we see by Matthew's account is that these two thieves were similar because they committed the same crime. They were robbers. They were thieves. They were, they were plunderers. But here's what's so fascinating. As I was studying this week, one of the things that the Lord revealed to me as I was just wrestling with this passage is that many commentators argue that these weren't your everyday run-of-the-mill thieves. Because in those days, theft wouldn't get you killed. Theft wasn't a capital offense. So what we see is that these individuals had to be more than just thieves because theft doesn't get you killed, right? But, but here's what we discover when we look at this story. One of the things that commentators argue is that the reason why these weren't just your everyday run-of-the-mill thieves is because there's a good chance that these thieves were actually zealots. They were insurgents. They were terrorists, okay? And so they robbed and they stealed. They stole, but they also killed on behalf of Israel and against Rome. So there's a good chance, scholars say, that these two thieves were actually part of the same group that Barabbas was a part of. We'll get to Barabbas a little bit later at the end. Barabbas is the individual who's on trial, who's about to be killed, and, 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 and Pontius Pilate says, who do you want? Do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? And they're, they're like, give us, give us Barabbas. Let Barabbas go. We, we want Jesus to die. So, so what commentators argue is that these two thieves, there's a good chance that these two thieves were zealots, they were insurgents, they were terrorists, and they were part of the same group that Barabbas was a part of, okay? So the first thing we see is that these two thieves, according to Matthew, were similar in their crime. But not only were they, sim not only were they just similar in their crime, they were also similar in their condition. And here's what I mean by condition. Luke uses a completely different word to describe these two individuals, okay? He doesn't describe them as thieves, he describes them as criminals. Now, why is that so important? Because the word criminal in Greek is a very strong word. And what it does is it reveals not their trade, but their nature, their condition. Because here's what the word thieves, mean, I mean criminal, means in the original language. It means to be morally evil, to be wicked or corrupt. So he, that's, that's the word that Luke uses. He doesn't call them thieves. He calls them criminals, morally evil, wicked, corrupt people. That's what these two men were. So what we see 
is that based on Matthew's account and based on Luke's account, these two individuals were similar both in crime and in condition. But that's the only similarities they had. What I discovered this week as I was studying this passage is that they were actually, they're actually more different than they are the same. Here are the two ways in which these two individuals were different. They were different in their fear, and they were different in their faith. The first way in which these two individuals were different is that they were different in their fear. Here's what's fascinating about the first thief, the one who rejected God. Look what he says in verse 39. If you can put verse 39 up for me. Look what he says about Jesus. He says, one of the criminals hung there, uh, hung, who hung there hurled insults at him, at Jesus, saying, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Okay? Now, here's what I need you to see about this first thief. This first thief did not fear God. And the reason why we know that he did not fear God is because that phrase there where it says he hurled insults, in the Greek, it means that he reviled Jesus. He slandered Jesus. He blasphemed against Jesus. So this was an individual who did not fear God at all. Not even a little bit. But what one Bible teacher brought up that, that really stood out to me is even though he did not fear God, it didn't mean that he didn't fear something. He didn't fear God because his fear was redirected somewhere else. Here's what's interesting about this. When you look at the story, and I don't have time to jump into the rest of the passage, but when you look at Luke 23, what we see is that there was different groups of people that were at the cross. There was the crowd, there were the soldiers, and there were the religious leaders, okay? What's interesting is that the soldiers and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, could not be any more different. This group was conservative, and the other group was liberal. They could not be any more different. There's literally nothing that these two groups ever agreed on, except Jesus. They both, of well, the three groups, it was the crowd, the soldiers, and, uh, uh, and, and, and then the, the Pharisees. They all looked at Jesus, and they said, how foolish is this? They all agreed about the foolishness of the cross. To them, the cross was foolishness. Jesus wasn't God, and the cross was proof that he wasn't God. So here's what the Bible teacher I was listening to said. He said, the, the thief that, that hurls insults at Jesus, he was fearing, but he wasn't fearing God. He was fearing man. Here's why. Because for the first time in his life, he wasn't an outcast anymore. For the first time in his life, he wasn't an outsider anymore. All these people, the soldiers... The crowd, the Pharisees, all these people looked down on him before. They, he, he, was, he was a nobody. He was an outcast. For the first time ever, he has an opportunity to be on the inside. And these people who never agree on anything finally agree on something, that Jesus isn't God and that the cross is foolishness. And so he's like, okay, I, I'm with them. He hurls insults at Jesus. He didn't fear God because he was too busy fearing man. Now let's look at the other thief. Let's look at the fear of the other thief. Look what it says in verse 40. It says, but the other thief rebuked him and said, don't you fear God? Now, now the word there, fear, which I just find so, so awesome, it, it means to respect someone, to be in awe of someone, or to worship someone. So this individual, at some point, he changes his mind. Because what we're told in the Gospel of Matthew is that he was just as uh, uh, disrespectful and just as blasphemous as the other guy. And then all of a sudden, he starts changing his mind, the passage says. And he goes from not fearing God to fearing God. He goes from being a reviler of God to being a respecter of God. He goes from blaspheming God to blessing God. He goes from tearing God down to lifting God up. That's what we see. That unlike the first thief, his fear wasn't horizontal towards man. It was vertical towards God. Let me, let me ask you a question here tonight. My question for you tonight is this. What do you fear? As you, as you approach God on this Good Friday 2019, what, what, do, what, do, you, what do you fear? 
What, what fear do you find motivating you tonight? Is it, is it a fear of God? Or is it a fear of man? What opinion most matters to you tonight? What voice is speaking loudest to you tonight? Is it God's? Or is it man's? Because here's the thing. We might live in a very different time than these individuals, but, but our culture is very similar to this culture and this. The people in our day don't agree on anything. Okay? Conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats, uh, the uh, 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 postmodernists and traditionalists don't agree on anything. But the one thing that our culture agrees on is that the cross is foolish. It's the one thing that everybody agrees on. The cross is foolish. And so if the cross is foolish and everyone else is on this side, where are you? Do, 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 are you more concerned about what God thinks or are you more concerned about what your unsaved neighbor thinks or your unsaved coworker thinks or your unsaved family member thinks? Who, whose opinion are you worried about? Whose voice are you listening to? Whose opinion is informing you? That's the question that you have to answer. Listen, if you want to be a free thinker, if you want to be someone who, who is unique and, 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 and free-spirited, if you will, you want to be different from everybody else, then fear God. Because ain't nobody else doing that. Ain't nobody else fearing God. Sorry, my, my, my little thing fell off, so we're going to put that right there. Okay. Ain't nobody else fearing God. Okay. That's the first thing that we see, that there is no group of people, there is no party, there is no family, there is no nation, there is no culture that finds the, the cross sensible. None. And so if you want to be an individual who's free thinking, if you want to be independent, if you want to be different, fear God. Because ain't nobody else doing that. And if you don't, then you're just like the rest. Okay? So, so the first area in which these individuals were different was in their fear of God. But the other, the other area in which they were different is in their faith. They weren't just different in their fear, but they were different in their faith. Let's go back to the first thief. Look what he says in verse 39. In verse 39, he says, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Okay. Now, if, if all you did was look at what he says, it seems like he has the right language, right? It, it seems like his theology is on point. He says, aren't you the Messiah? He is. Save yourself and us. But what's fascinating about this individual is that his faith wasn't actually in Jesus. Here's, what, 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 here's how I would put it. He didn't have a saving faith. He had a situational faith. There's a lot of people in here who have situational faith. Okay? My, my faith only shows up when, I, when, when the right situation shows up. He had a situational faith. Not a saving faith, a situational faith. Here's what this man was struggling with. He wasn't struggling with self. He wasn't doing self-denial. It was self-preservation. There's a difference between self-denial and self-preservation. Everybody loves Jesus when, when the bullets are flying. Everybody needs Jesus when the bank account is empty. Everybody's praying when the test results are bad. Not a saving faith. A situational faith is what he had. That's what he had. What's interesting is that when you look at this individual... He, he's looking at Jesus, and what he is saying to himself is like, okay, I want to know this Jesus. I want to have a relationship with this Jesus, but only on my terms. He says, Jesus, I will believe in you if. I will believe in you if. That's what a lot of us say to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, I will follow you if. You know what that means? That your God is not Jesus. It's the thing that comes after the if. That's what you're really worshiping. See, Jesus to him wasn't an end in itself. He was a means to an end. Jesus wasn't his savior. Jesus was his assistant. 
That's what we see here in this passage. He doesn't say, Jesus saved my soul. He's saying, Jesus saved my skin. That's what a lot of us are doing here tonight. You know that? A lot of us are coming to Jesus tonight and we're saying, hey, Jesus, I, my, my, you can take care of my soul later. Just, just save my skin tonight. He's not saying save my soul. He's saying save my skin. He's not worried about his future condemnation. He's, worrying about, he's worried about his current circumstances. So what we see is that the first thief had faith, but not in Jesus. Let's look at the second thief. Look what it says in verse 40. It says, don't you fear God, he says, as he rebukes the other one, since you are under the same sentence. And then look what it says next. He says, we are punished justly. Everyone say justly. justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. So what we see is that his faith is radically different from the other one's faith. It's different in two ways. He has a different view of himself, and he has a different view of Jesus. Okay? That's what proves to me that he has a saving faith. Not a situational faith, but, but a saving faith. Look how he views himself. He says, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. The, the word there, justly, it means rightly. It means fairly. The word there, deserved, it means a proper uh, a response or a worthy response, something that has been merited. So he sees himself as, as a sinner. That's what he thinks. I am a sinner and I need a savior. Okay? But, but here's what's so fascinating about this man's faith. This man's faith is so strong that if, if what commentators say is true, that, that, that he's a zealot, then him saying this is even more fascinating. Because there's no one in all of Jerusalem who felt they were more righteous in what they were doing than the zealots. They were convinced they were doing God's will. The Romans were the bad guys. And so I'm doing what God's asking me to do. And so when he says that we're sinners, that I'm a broken sinner, he's not saying that he's sinning against Rome because a zealot would never admit that. He's saying what, what, what David says in Psalm 51, which says, against you, against you, you only have I sinned. He knows that his sin is not towards Rome. It's towards God. Amen. That's what we see this individual doing. So, so the first way that we see his faith is different is in how he views himself. But the second way that we see his faith is different is in how he views Jesus. You know, what's beautiful about what he says to Jesus is that he shows us two things about Jesus that he believes. The first thing he believes about Jesus is that Jesus is righteous because he says this man has done nothing wrong. But then he also believes that Jesus is royal because he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your what? Kingdom. Your kingdom. So he believes that Jesus is righteous, but he also believes that Jesus is royal. He believes that Jesus is pure, but he also believes that Jesus is powerful. He believes that Jesus is able to save him and willing to save him. So think about this. This individual, the, the, the faith that this guy has, that this thief has, is infinitely greater than even the disciples because none of the disciples are even there. They're gone. They're gone. John shows up in a little bit, but, but, but they're gone. Okay? His faith is so strong that he sees Jesus as a victor even though Jesus is still a victim. He sees Jesus as a conqueror even though Jesus is still being conquered. He sees Jesus on a throne even though Jesus is still on a cross. That's how much faith this man had. That's how much faith this man had. He did not have a situational faith. He had a saving faith. He didn't go to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, save my skin. He could care less about his skin. He said, Jesus, save my soul. So, so here's the question that I want to ask you here tonight. What type of faith are you approaching God with tonight? Are you here tonight with a saving faith or a situational faith? Is Jesus uh, uh, your assistant or your savior? Is, is Jesus prominent in your life or is he preeminent in your life? Is Jesus a means to an end or is he the end in, in itself? 
Are you coming to Jesus tonight and asking him to save your skin or to save your soul? How are you viewing Jesus tonight? Is Jesus beautiful to you or is he just useful to you? I can't answer that. But hopefully you can. So, the first thing that we see, the first truth, the first part of the story that I wanted to look at is I wanted to look at the two thieves. Now, the second part of the story that I want to look at is I want to look at the two crosses. Now, if you are a math person here tonight, you're super bothered by that, by that, that, that second point. Because you're like, look, well, I know you're bad at math, bro, but come on, man. Like, who can't count to three, right? It's clear that there's three crosses here. There's three men dying, and as a result, there's three crosses. But I actually put two crosses on purpose. And the reason why I put two crosses on purpose is because even though there are three crosses literally, there's actually only two crosses figuratively. There are only two types of crosses in this story. Only two types. And here's the difference between them. The first cross, you die for you, for you. And the second cross, Jesus dies for you. Listen, every person in here is going to die at some point. Okay? I heard a stat the other day. I think it's true. It says 10 out of 10 people die. I don't know. I don't know if it's true. <laughs> but that was the stat. 10 out of 10 people die. So that means that every person in here is going to die. The question is, when you die, are you going to die on your own cross? For your sins, or are you going to die with Jesus on his cross? Are you going to die by Christ? Like the, the first thief, he died by Christ. He was right next to him. He died by Christ for his own sin. The, the second thief, he died with Christ, and Jesus died for his sin. So the question is, when you die, which cross will you die on? Well, it all determines on which thief you are. If you're the first thief, then you die for your own sins. If you're the second thief, then Jesus dies for him. So here's what I want to do. I want to tell you, if you're sitting here tonight and, 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 and you, well, let, me, let me put this. I want to speak to two groups before I jump into this. The first group that I want to speak to tonight are the people who are here who, who have yet to place their faith in Jesus. Maybe, maybe you grew up in church and maybe you walked away from it. Or maybe, you know, maybe, maybe you, 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 have been coming for a while, but you still don't know if it's for you. Or maybe this is your first time back at church in years, okay? If that's you and you still haven't placed your faith in Jesus, what I want to do in the next few minutes is I want to give you the two benefits, the two advantages of dying on the second cross, okay? And my hope is that by the end of this message, you will be someone who moves from that first cross to the second cross, that you would go some, someone who's, who's, who's paying for his own sins to having Jesus pay for their sins. But the second group that I'm talking to here tonight are the people who've already placed your faith in Jesus, people like me, people who are coming to your, your 10th or your 20th or your 30th Good Friday, and it doesn't even mean anything anymore. My hope in, in giving you these advantages and giving you these benefits of being on the second cross is that you might be reminded again of the privileges and the blessings and the implications of the gospel. So let's get into this. There are two benefits Two benefits that you get, two advantages that you get if you die with Christ instead of by Christ if you die with Christ. The first benefit is the grace from Christ. The second benefit is union with Christ. So the first benefit is grace from Christ. The second benefit is union with Christ, okay? You know, one of the things that stood out to me this week, it really just stood out to me and, and, and caught my eye, caught my attention as I was studying the more I studied this passage, the more I was blown away by the audacity and the boldness of the second thief. Like the more I found out how messed up he was, I was like, how dare you ask Jesus to forgive you? How, how dare you say, hey, remember me? Who, who do you think you are, bro? Seriously, I, the more I saw how wicked and broken he was, the more blown away I was by the audacity and the boldness of his faith. The question is, why is he so audacious? Why is he so bold? The answer, grace. He believed in grace. You know what I'm convinced of? I am convinced that he saw Jesus because right before he goes from being like the other thief 
to being one that believes in Jesus, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. He sees Jesus forgiving the, the, the Pharisees and the soldiers and the crowd. And he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. If he can forgive them, maybe he can forgive me. If, if these people can get grace, then maybe I can get some grace. That's why he's so audacious. That's why he's so bold. Because he sees Jesus displaying grace. He knows there's something different about this Jesus. That's why he doesn't, you, what was, was beautiful about this man, he doesn't bargain with Jesus. He doesn't haggle with Jesus. He doesn't negotiate with Jesus. He pleads with Jesus. He pleads with him. He says, remember me. Please. Please remember me, he says. He pleads. What's beautiful is he doesn't say, repay me. He doesn't say, reward me. He doesn't say, reimburse me. He says, remember me. Remember me. That's grace language. Religious people say, repay me. Religious people say, reward me. Religious people say, reimburse me. Gospel people say, remember me. And you know what's beautiful about that word, remember? Here's what it means. It means to be mindful of someone. It means to not forget someone. It means to not overlook someone. So, so he's saying, Jesus, 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 I've, I've been forgotten by everyone else. I've been pushed away by everyone else. Please, not you. Remember me, please. Don't, don't forget me. There's a good chance that his own family wasn't there. Why would they be? Everyone else had abandoned him. Everyone else had walked away from him. He says, don't forget me. Remember me. I don't know about you, but, but there are moments in my life where I feel forgotten. Right? You, you, maybe you're sitting here today and you feel forgotten by your spouse. You feel forgotten by your parents. You feel forgotten by your friends and your family. You, you, you just feel like people don't notice you. You've been forgotten. And listen, the cross is proof that Jesus hasn't forgotten you. He remembers you. It says in Hebrews 2, verse 6, same Greek word. In Hebrews 2, verse 6, it says that who are we that God is mindful of us? Who are we? Why would God remember me? We all deserve to be forgotten. And yet at the cross, Jesus remembers us. Amen. You know what's beautiful about this? That if this man was a Jewish person, and especially if he was a Jewish zealot, there is a good chance that he grew up going to the, to the temple. He's in Jerusalem, so, so he grew up learning uh, the Torah. He grew up memorizing verses. He, 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 did, he had his bar mitzvah and everything else that every Jewish boy would do. He had all the information. But here's what's funny. Even though he knew God's law probably by heart, God's law couldn't change him. Listen, law can't change you. Here's what a lot of people do, right? What a lot of people do is preachers especially, they give you law and law and law and law, and then they can't figure out why you never change because the law was never meant to change you. The law was meant to convict you. The law was meant to expose you. The law is a mirror. It just shows you how bad you look. It doesn't tell you what to do about it. He had God's law. That's why what, 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 what one author that I read, he said that, that when we, all we do is preach his law, it's like every, let's say you are a metal bar. When all you do is preach law is you try to bend that bar and bend that bar. And you put all this external pressure on the person. You put external pressure hoping that maybe at some point that person will bend. But you know what happens? The moment the pressure is lifted up, you're no longer bending it. The bar goes right back to how it was. That's all the law does. It's like trying to bend a bar. But, but here's what's beautiful. God's love doesn't do that. God's law might do that, but God's love doesn't do that. God's love, what, what grace does is grace shows up and it doesn't bend the bar. It melts the bar. God's love, it, it melts the bar. So there's no bending. He melts it and then he can do whatever he wants with it. That's why the, God's love is so much better than God's law. This guy, he had tried God's law. He knew the rules. He knew everything that was right and was wrong. It didn't work for him. If anything, it's the very thing that made him rebel in the first place. But he shows up and what changes him is God's grace. That's why in Titus chapter 2, it's, if, if, if you look at Titus 2, 11 to 12, what, what, what Paul says there in that letter, he says, it's not the law of God that changes you. 
It's not the law of God that teaches you to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. He says it's the, the grace of God. The grace of God is what changes you. I remember when I first saw Titus 2, and I saw the second part of the verse, and, and the verse said, it teaches you to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. I was convinced that the it was God's law, but it's not God's law. It's the grace of God that changes you. That's why in, in, in the, 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 the hymn that, that we all sing, Amazing Grace, what enables the blind to see? Grace. What, what enables the wretch to be saved? Grace. What enables the lost to be found? Grace. It's only grace. It's the only thing that God offers. It's grace. That's why one of the things that ticks me off, I saw even commentators do it while I was, pre while I was preparing this week. So there's commentators that what they do is they compare the two thieves. And that, oh, here, here, here's why the second thief does what he does. He, he, he did it maybe because he grew up in a, in a, better, in a better Jewish home. He, 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 he had a better family growing up. He had a good uh, a Sunday school class that taught him all the right things. He had a more tender heart. No, he didn't. <laughs> no. I refuse to, to admit that. He was no better than the other guy. They were the same when it came to their crime and their condition. We already determined that. He was no better. Don't give him glory. It's not him who gets the glory. What saved him wasn't his upbringing. What saved him wasn't his Awana class. What saved him wasn't his memory verses. What saved him wasn't his family of origin. What saved him was grace. It's the only thing we got. That's why Jesus looks at him and think about what Jesus says. Jesus says, today you will be with me. Today, he says. Jesus doesn't say, hey, hey, uh, uh, you'll be with me after you memorize some verses. And you'll be with me after you join a life group. You'll be with me after you serve at church. You'll be with me after you, you, you clean up yourself, after you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. No, no, no. Jesus says, today you'll be with me. That's grace. There's nothing for you to do. Today you'll be with me. That's why the world, what the world does is the world, what, what the world tries to deal with this sin issue. The world deals with the sin issue. And what I mean by the world, I mean counselors and social media and politicians and celebrities. The way they try to deal with our sin issue is they try to minimize the bad news. They're like, hey, you're, you're, you're not that bad. We're all pretty good. We're, we're all great people here. Yeah, you're not that bad. And the world tries to minimize the bad news. Listen, you are that bad. You are that wicked. You are that broken. You are that depraved. You are that sinful. All those things are true, but guess what? Jesus is better. Jesus is greater. And Jesus is stronger. The gospel doesn't minimize the bad news. The gospel magnifies the good news. So, so the first benefit, the first advantage of dying on the second cross, of dying not by Christ but with Christ, is, your, is the grace of Christ. But, but the second benefit is your union with Christ. Your union with Christ. You know, one of the things that I misunderstood, I didn't even realize I misunderstood it until I started studying the passage. When Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise, I always thought that that promise had to do with heaven. Oh, man, look how sweet, how sweet is that. This guy's dying. He's on his, uh, his, his last rope. He's, he's, he's about to die and about to go, and Jesus gives him heaven. But what, what, what God convicted me of as I was studying the passage and looking at the original Greek is that if you look at how it's written in the Greek, the emphasis is not on paradise. The emphasis is on the word with. It's not his destination. It's the unity that Jesus, with, with Jesus, is the with me. Literally, the way it's written in Greek, the emphasis is not on in paradise. It's on you will be with me. That promise really doesn't have anything to do with heaven. It has to do with our union with Christ. We are united with him. Think about how ridiculous what Jesus is saying is. Jesus is saying, you and I, now that you place your faith in me, you and I, we are so connected that your, your, your sinful record has become mine and my perfect record has become yours. That's what he's saying. I am imputing your sinfulness to me and imputing my righteousness back to you. We are the same now. We are united now. 
That's why in Ephesians chapter 2, one of the most ridiculous passages in all the Bible, it, it talks about our union with Christ. And it says that we have, been, we have died with Christ. We have been made alive with Christ. We have been raised with Christ. And we are seated with Christ. All of that is in the past tense. It, it already happened. In, in, the, in God's view, that already happened. Past tense. All those things are true of you right now. Right now. Today. They're true of you today. You, you know what happens to your soul when you believe that? When you believe that God sees you and treats you and loves you and honors you the way he honors Jesus? You know what happens to you when that happens? Listen, if your union with Christ is true, then it is by far the most overlooked benefit that we have in the gospel. Listen, if your union with Christ is true, if, if, if you're already fully loved and fully accepted and fully approved of, and God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus, if that's true, then you should no longer be destroyed by criticism. Amen. You should no longer be concerned about your overweight. Amen. You should no longer be trying to please people. You should no longer have to pretend, because who cares what people think? If that's what God thinks, who cares what you think? Amen. If this is true, it changes everything. Amen. You don't have to be perfect anymore. No. You don't have to be successful anymore. You don't have to pretend anymore. It's over. If it's true, it changes everything. The gospel humbles you and at the same time makes you confident. You have this humble confidence. On, on the one hand, you're humbled because Jesus had to die for you. But on the other hand, you're confident because he was glad to die for you. If you get that, if that hits you, it changes you. So, tonight as we approach the table, the question that I ask of you is this. Which thief best describes you? Which thief most looks like you? Which cross are you dying on? Are you placing your faith in yourself and dying by Jesus? Or are you placing your faith in him and dying with Jesus? That's the question. Let's pray.